Welcome to the Songbook Series Podcast. Episode 2, The Legend of Harvest Queen. Hello, this is Chris Leroy from the Hickman Leroy Songbook. This is our second podcast, the Halloween special that contrasts 2005's Harvest Queen from Johnny Hickman's solo album, Palm Hinge, with an earlier demo called Haunted. It was recorded in the original Lo-Fi studio in Redlands, California in 1999. We start with a Five Stock interview, September 9th, 2007, right after Camp Out 3, hosted by Mort. He introduces Lo-Fi engineer Maria Baglian, who talks about the first Palm Hinge recordings, and is later interrupted by yours truly. And yeah, we actually have Maria in the room with us. She's been spending most of this uh, interview stuff behind the board, making sure things are going right. But she's actually, she came out and piped up a little there and put in a few choice words. You got, so we'll got any interesting have. stories about the Palm Hinge session, Maria? Well, there's actually one, um, one song on there, actually a couple songs on there that um, Johnny came in and was doing tons of pre-production um, work. And I believe it was like April, so we really hadn't been open that long. And uh, John was working with Teddy when Teddy was out in Arizona. And it was it Tucson? Yeah, something like that. Not mistaken. And uh, he goes, well, i got to record these songs. I've got to get them over to him. So he records Hacker Boy. He records a uh, version of uh, Southern Cal. And he, the funny thing is he did already have a version of Southern Cal, but he had to do it again. And uh, he did San Bernardino Boy. And then he did Friends. And... You know, it's very okay, yeah, he's going off and do that. And if he comes back here, oh, good, that'll be fine. And then he shows up here again, and he goes, well, we're going to keep a couple songs that we did. And I'm just like, oh, really? I mean, I just threw a couple mics up there, and you just kind of played around with your voice, and played the guitar, and lo and behold, Friends and San Bernardino Boy are the original demos that we did, but they just, there are some songs that when we recorded them, they just weren't able to recapture everything. The tones were good, the, the spirit was right. goes back to even their original lo-fi studios when we were in Redlands, a little tiny place where we recorded a song called Haunted that uh, Chris and Johnny had worked on. And uh, later on the lyrics got changed and became Harvest Queen over here by the time it came over. And Johnny would always take people out to the car. He goes, you got to hear this version of this song. This is the sound I'm going for. This is, I just love this sound. And he'd play this, you know, CD that I made for him back in 99 um, of haunted yeah. without the lyrics and he was just always insistent that's what I want that's what I want and he had traveled all over the place trying to record the version of haunted harvest queen um, at all these other studios with all these other musicians and ultimately it kind of came back to that cool little vibe that Johnny and Chris and um, a drummer named Chad um, ended up putting together and it was just a really cool uh, yeah, just pass it around. <laughs> secret, secret victory, because uh, I know that John plays with you know, incredible musicians all the time. You know, they've got great session people he works with and great other people from other bands. And I play bass uh, on that album, Upside Down. I'm a left-handed guitar player. Wait, wait, wait. You play Upside Down? I play, well, not physically. You play, the bass is upside <laughs> down. I play the bass upside down. And... Uh, because I don't even know what to do with a, with a, if they, someone gave me a left-handed bass, I wouldn't understand what I'm doing. I learned to play upside down on bass, and, and, uh, and after all those years, I mean, from 1999 to 2005, he tried to find someone to replace me on bass in that tune. He could not get that person. <laughs>
history of scary and haunted riffs goes back to uh, Peter Green, the original Fleetwood Mac, Black Magic Woman era, before oh well, was Green Manalishi. When John brought this riff to me, uh, I zeroed into this channel. I said, this sounds just like Fleetwood Mac. And we wanted to build a track that had those same sonic jumps. And I knew it would be a great guitar showpiece for Johnny. So I made John a sampler disc that included uh, some of those Fleetwood Mac tracks plus Albatross. Uh, then some blues, Sun House singing Death Letter, Howlin' Wolf Ain't Superstitious, even Jeff Buckley singing Grace and a Charlie Mingus jazz piece Ecclesiasticus. But it ended with I Only Have Eyes For You, uh, old Flamingo's doo-wop piece that is really scary. As a little kid, I would listen to that uh, you know, under my covers on the transistor radio and it just scared the hell out of me. So I wanted John to get really spooked. Since you left me here for dead, a dusty frame, an empty bed. Lyrically, haunted is uh, pretty straightforward. It's a haunted house. And it's about a devil deal that you live with. The performance of Haunted is deep and dark and spooky, and that wonderful extended ending captures the, uh, the mystery of the song. Now, Harvest Queen. Uh, the riff is the same. The basic tracks are, are still embedded, so we're building a new song on the old framework. And the solos are augmented by um, David Immogluck, but the intensity and most of that is still John. Now the Fleetwood Mac feel still comes through on the acoustic break. Lyrically, Harvest Queen takes a different path. David Lowry made a suggestion uh, that, that music it brought up the image of Harvest Queen, and Johnny morphed that into, into some new lyrics. Where the original song tapped into this, the soul of this dark house and that kind of language, Harvest Queen has a more earthy feel. And the woman in question is still a devil, uh, but she's got more sacrificial baggage. It's in the bridge where the songs vary the most. In Haunted, my lyrics centered on the pain of the relationship. It goes, I'm high, but I feel my pain. In the same bridge in, ha in Harvest Queen, Johnny gives you these details, the monkey's paw and the flesh and the straw to convince you to not go towards the Harvest Queen. Obviously, we love both versions, and uh, that's why we're releasing the Songbook Series CD that uh, will cover some of these cool lost gems. So thanks for joining us on the podcast, and we'll see you next time. Bye!
Hello, everyone, and welcome to Dylan Box. I'm your co-host, Ryan Harsh. And I am Chris Leroy. We're thanks for joining us for another installment of been, the Dylan Box. It's been a little while. Yeah. How have you been? I've been good. Uh, we've been uh, working this show, and people really seem to enjoy the Dylan Boxes, so we were ready to move on to uh, to another piece. Mm-hmm. Uh, so should we look in the we're Dylan past, boxes? I think we're past due. Yeah, reach in there. Reach in there for the Dylan box. Watch your hand. Yeah, never know. Yeah. Well, usually I pull something in there. Oh, very small. That's okay. Remember these? Yeah. <laughs> this old thing called a compact CD. disc. Compact disc. Right. Well, it looks like we have a uh, Oh Mercy this week. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you what, like like my thing with, with Bob was when I first started listening to him, yeah. I really didn't go past Desire for the longest time. I, and I knew all the stuff, and I, I discovered him early 90s okay. for me. And so I, I don't know why, but I just, I didn't really mess with that other stuff. I was almost like a purist, I guess you could say. I didn't mm-hmm. like that old stuff. Yeah, um, I had heard snatches of it. Um, and, and I was like, well, his voice has changed. I don't know if I... I dig it too much now, uh-huh. you know, but as I, you know, that, that kind of kept me uh, away from so much. Yeah. Um, and then as I've gotten older, I'm thinking I'm listening to this stuff like this mm-hmm. and I'm really starting to like it. Yeah. And that's what happened with this one. This kind of like, I had heard a little bit of it before mm-hmm. this episode, getting into it and then, you know, really immersing myself in it for the last week. And I'm really like what I hear. I'm interested about, the difference in the voice because that you reference that as one of the key things that is different right and certainly there's a big change between the 60s dylan that you really kind of grabbed into first or linked into first and then the dylan voices that ensued but it certainly not if the first Dylan you heard is the most recent album, yeah, you would you would say, okay, this is a that's this, true. This is a tough voice to live with, or right. maybe it's the best voice to live with. Right. But, when I when I heard this stuff from this era, it was that the voice kind of put me off. Okay. Um, it just it was different. It, it was you know because Dylan is a, is a singer. You're not getting talked about a lot, you know, for singing in the '60s and the '70s on the stuff he did. Right. In terms of him being like some brilliant singer, but. I think later on, um, it was just different. It kind of shocked me a little bit. It was different hmm. to me, and I wasn't completely into it okay. um, at the time. Um, but listening to it now, it has this on this recording, especially it has like this warmth to it um, that I that I hear, uh-huh. and it's the way it's recorded. Um, and and, and uh, to me, this album has a lot of atmosphere. Mm to it in the way that like a blonde on blonde does for nashville this one has that for like louisiana and the south okay to me and it's because of you know doing a little digging on the history of it it's because this was recorded in new orleans Mm -hmm. um and who's the producer uh Uh, daniel lenoir right so uh, so basically he dylan was uh hanging out with bono right and then uh, bono recommended Daniel and Wah, and then uh, they cross paths and they came together, um, and that's that's how we have this. And right? when he went to record, uh, usually he puts together kind of a hodgepodge of different musicians he wants to play with, right? And I think when he when he got there, Wah already had his his band, uh, yes, for good and for bad, sure. Because the atmosphere for me is one of the things that is uh at the time when the album came out it was a very welcome return to form sure people really it was pretty celebrated resurgence yes yeah, oh dylan's you know we He's had back. dylan's back yeah. kind of thing and ironically 10 years later they say the same thing about uh time out of mind yeah. Which we could do another time, but, yeah. but same same producer. Same producer. And it was like, hey, he's back. It's well, he's been around for a while. Right. Like, nice try though. But I liked the album. I remember talking my other uh, big Dylan head would have been John Hickman. Mm-hmm. And I always knew he loved uh Man with a Long Black uh, Coat. Yeah. And I think a lot of it it was about some of the atmosphere that was created because in that studio and, and an ambiance yes. to this album that uh 
was very appealing uh, to a lot of folks and is to sort of lure them back into these songs as I was of two minds. Sure. Uh, one was, I remember that kind of warmth that you're talking about, that atmosphere. And he, he created a, a, a kind of a very easy sounding music. It's, um, it, it's very accessible and uh, it, it kind of weaves like a little tapestry of sound. Mm -hmm. The second part I started listening to is how that sound and the atmosphere kind of bugged me after a while. And I, because eventually Dylan, who did have that resurgence again with Time Out of Mind and went back to Daniel Lenoir, stopped using Daniel Lenoir yeah. and started kind of saying, you know, I'm trying to remember exactly how he would quote, but it's just like, he's too worried about the sound. Right. You know? And and I went back, listened to this album and both and experienced both things. And so, oh, I really like the sound of this album and I could see how it starts a little bit to get in the way of the material. fancy takes its flight and soars away on thoughtful wing. Again my soul thrills with delight, and this the fancy theme I sing. From earthly scenes awhile I find release, and dwell upon the restful plains of peace. The plains of peace are passing fair, where naught disturbs and naught can harm. I find no sorrow, woe, or care. These all are lost in perfect calm. Bright are the joys, and pleasures never cease for those who dwell on the plains of peace. No scorching sun or blighting storm, no burning sand or desert drear, no fell disease or wasting form to mar the glowing beauty here. Decay and ruin ever must decrease here on the fertile, healthful plains of peace. What rare companionship I find, what hours of social joy I spend, what restfulness pervades my mind, communing with congenial friend. True happiness seems ever to increase while dwelling here upon the plains of peace. Ambitions, too, are realized. And that which I have sought on earth I find at last idolized. My longings ripen into worth, my fondest hopes no longer fear to cease, but bloom forth brightly on the plains of peace. Tis by my fancy, yet tis true, that somewhere, having done with earth, we shall another course pursue, according to our aim or worth. Our souls from mortal things must find release and dwell immortal on the plains of peace. <laughs> 